Honorable Minister, Dr. Yao Ose Ejichum, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for inviting me to share with you in this Olive Thanksgiving service. I shall assume all of you to be members of my church. <laughs> and so I'll dwell a bit on Thanksgiving. And then I will touch on what it means to live. Um, on the 31st night, many people will come thanking God, uh, blessing him that they didn't die. But just not dying doesn't mean anything. There will be a 31st night in your life that you die. You will not be part of it. And so I will touch on what it means to live. And then for the sake of our theme for this service, I will scratch on wisdom, wisdom. Let me begin from Psalm 92. Psalm 92, I read verse one and two. Psalm 92, verse one and two. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. The King James Version will say that it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing. Now, if he's saying that it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, then it's trying to educate us to understand that it is good to develop an attitude of gratitude to the Lord because it is a good thing. It is a good habit. It is beneficial to give thanks unto the Lord. It benefits the one who is offering the thanks, and then it also benefits those who will be listening to the thanksgiving. It is rewarding to give thanks to the Lord than to murmur, grumble, complain, and worry. It is a good thing. You see, God deserves our gratitude, and it is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. There's no lack of subject matter so far as praise is concerned. His love and kindness is an unending theme for the morning, and his faithfulness is sufficient to occupy the nighttime hours. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, O Most High. In a day like this, it is befitting that all of us give thanks to the Almighty God, when we reflect on the year just gone past, we need to give thanks to the Lord. And then we also have to thank him about the year 2023, what he's about to do. Now, but as we reflect on 2022, the feeling may vary depending on how you measure it. Some might have lost a spouse, others might have married in the year 2022. So the feeling will vary some give birth, others might have lost a child. You see, some might have married, others might have had the grace of promotion, but some might have lost a job. So the feeling will vary. But no matter what happened, once you are here with us today, the righteous requirement of you is to give thanks to the Lord is to give thanks to the Lord. I will suggest some posture that we should take to help us develop an attitude of gratitude unto the Lord. You need to take a certain posture so you can develop an attitude of gratitude unto the Lord. Number one, the grace of God should not be taken for granted. See, but sometimes we take the grace of God for granted and do not make any effort to say thank you to God. Jesus healed 10 lepers. Then one of them came back and said, thank you. Then Jesus said, I thought I healed 10 of you. Where are the nine? So I thought that Jesus in his modesty would have said, oh, it doesn't matter, Ingeshi. But not knowing that he was expecting them to come back and say thank you. So today we want you to thank God. Let us thank God for what he has done for us. 
He is waiting for our thanksgiving. We don't have to take the grace of God for granted. Why we sometimes take the grace of God for granted is just simply this. We do not reflect. We don't reflect. Psalm 124 says, Had it not been the Lord on our side, let Israel say, now if you begin to reflect, you will know that God is a great God and that he's been good to you. Number two, we should count our blessings, not our curses. You see, we all don't have it all. But sometimes we concentrate so much on our lack to the extent that we become people who are ungrateful to God. Can I respectfully ask you to stand up if you can? If, if you aren't, no, don't, don't worry. Now, just thank God for your legs. You see, if somebody had to aid you here because you were sitting in a wheelchair, somehow you might never have ended up becoming here. But we have legs, and we don't thank God for that. Some of us can see without any aid. Let us thank God for the blessings he blesses us, not the lack. Please sit down. Psalm 100 says that, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his pasture, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gaze with thanksgiving, and his cause with praise. Give thanks to him. Praise his name. For the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through generations. The life we have, the legs we have, the children, the spouses we have. There was this young couple who were always disturbing me in my first station. They always come with a, a challenge, a problem. This one is doing this, this one is doing that. So one day they came, I said, okay, just bow down your heads. I'm going to pray to dissolve the marriage. But before I do that, your man, pray first. And then after you have finished praying that this marriage is dissolved today, I'll put a blessing on it. For about five minutes, he was not praying. And I was also quiet. Then I saw the, the, the lady open the eyes. He stood and then took the hand around the neck of the man. As if to say that, please, don't pray that kind of prayer. <laughs> See, you may have a spouse. The man may not be the kind of a man that you want, but you see, you just leave him and go and marry another one. You realize that human beings, we are not angels. Just thank God for your spouse. Some people want husbands they don't get. But you have one, you're always complaining. Let us give thanks to God for what we have, not what we do not have. Let's give thanks to God for what we have. My dad came to visit me. At, around that, he was around age 75 years that he came with some challenges. So we took him to the hospital and he was well. Whilst he was still with us in the house, one morning he came around, he navigated his way to my office. He told me about some pain in the knee. I heard it, but I pretended as if I didn't hear. But my dad is quite a forceful man. So he came back again. But you see, my dad was a victim of the 79 to 81 revolution. All his colleagues, within two years, they were dead. After they had been arrested, I know them very well. You know what I did to my old man? I just asked him the whereabouts of Mr. Corey. So, who would that I want here? Then I asked him, what about Mr. Bonsu? Oh, 
Haven't I told you this about some 15 years ago? Then I said, you see, all these colleagues are dead. But for you, you will just have a pain in your knee. And this knee has carried you for 75 years. What do you want the knee to do? And then when I said that, he looked at me and said, I didn't cry. Nye, nye, <laughs> you see, we always have to count our blessings, not our curses. We have to develop an attitude of gratitude to the mighty one. In my first station, I was supposed to go out on a visit with this young man. We have slated the time, agreed. But when I got to his house, I didn't like what uh, he was doing. Because he was going to delay us so much. I just got there and I realized that the wife has finished preparing some fufu. And I didn't like what I saw because of the bigness of the bowl of fufu. Because I knew that he was going to waste too much time. Too much time. So I said, ah, Dickin, will you be able to consume this? And then he looked at my face and said, Osofu, nyam duma. <laughs> so by the grace of God, I can, I can consume all this. Uh, because I thought that he hadn't been faithful to the time and all that. I wasn't too happy. Uh, so I, I didn't even smile. Because I, <laughs> But years later, I was told a friend of mine, an elder of our church, wasn't well at all. I went to see him. The wife was trying to encourage him to just sip some water. And the man was not able to do that. It was that day that I appreciated what the Dickens said several years before. That by the grace of God, this stomach of mine can consume this. See, let us count our blessings, not our curses. Because this, my friend, was just, couldn't just sip anything. But he said, this stomach of mine can take care of this by the grace of God. Let us concentrate on what God has done for us, not what we do not have. Number three, you need to live in a daytight compartment. Just live in the day. Shut the door to yesterday. And close the unborn tomorrow and live in a daytight compartment. Now, when we were growing up, any time that someone died in our school, we would sing, Lead can lead light. So it was a song that I actually didn't like. Because any time that I remember that song, you begin to see ghosts. Because any time that anyone that you remember, Bukhari, you remember that especially when you were in primary school. But one day, I just decided to just pay attention to the words in this song. And then there was this line. The distance seen, one step, enough for me. The distance seen, one step, enough for me. That's that. So after all, this song is not about ghosts. The distance seen. Don't rush into it. One step is enough for you. Live in a daytight compartment. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not come. What we all have as a gift, that is why we call today a present. It is a gift. Enjoy that gift. Work very hard in the day. It is what you do today that you open avenues for you tomorrow. Don't worry about the unborn tomorrow. Shut the door to yesterday, and you will develop an attitude of gratitude. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or drink, or about your body. What you wear is not life more than food, and a body more than clothes. Hmm. See, sometimes we disturb ourselves. We carry unnecessary load. We are worrying about food. We are worrying about clothes. So we are carrying needless burdens. Then somehow, we put so much food on our minds. And then you wake up in the morning and you start walking like this. What kind of dress will fit this body? Meanwhile, 
we're just worrying about clothes. And now the body is destroyed. And sometimes the life is taken away. What will food do to the dead? Now, this scripture is not saying that don't plan. No. What this scripture is saying is this. Don't worry. Don't be tormented from disturbing thoughts and with cares, anxieties, troubles of the world. The scripture is saying that you close the door to yesterday, shut that of tomorrow, and live in today. Number four, you need to have the firm assurance that your destiny is secured in God. Unfortunately, the preaching that is going on in our churches does not give us that assurance that God is. We are reducing Christianity to superstition and calendar. We are reducing it to anointing oils and rings and water. We are reducing it to so many things that are beggarly and feeble. Let us have the confident assurance that God will not give us up for the devil to pray upon us when you are a Christian. Joseph told his brothers, Genesis 50 verse 20, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Let us have the confident assurance that God is with us those who think this way, for them, everything is God. They don't blame demons or anybody. They believe that God is on their side. Number five. What else can a bond servant say to the master? Is it not thank you? What else? If we are a servant in the house, what else can you say to your master than to say thank you? You spend all the time cooking. Let's say you cook some rice. Then the mistress comes. You share the rice out to the children. What is left is what we call a moise. Then they scrape it for you. When you receive it, what will you do? What else can a servant say to the master? Is it not to say thank you? Romans chapter 9, verse 20. Romans 9, 20. This is a verse that some of you may not be familiar with. But I pray that you look at it closely. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Some of you, you are not even happy about your shortness. So what will you do? I mean, what can you do about being short? What else can we say than to say, Father, we thank you. Let us relax in our spirit and develop an attitude of gratitude. Now, so we are here in 2023. What does it mean to live? Because the dead praise not the Lord. Neither those who go down into silence. No. No. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, the scripture says. They rest from their labor. Whatever your hands finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, where we are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. This is a fact. So what does it mean to live? Philippians 1, verse 20 to 22. Philippians chapter 1. This is the Apostle Paul. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Then he gave us this powerful statement, the motto he lived by, his mantra, his vision. For me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. But my interest is in the next verse, 22. Now, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? 
I do not know. Now, he was hanged between dying and living because he was in the claws of the Roman Empire. They have arrested him. He was not seeing any way of being delivered. Then he rises from prison to the church in Philippi. And then he's saying that if I live, it is Christ. But what else? What do I choose? If I am to go on living in the body, if for any reason I'm spared to live again, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Now, what is he trying to say? What he's saying is this. Living means fruitful labor. We have all been spared to live in 2023. We must let 2023 count. It must be fruitful labor as long as we live. Because where we are going, the grave, we are not going to work. So when we live, it means hard work, fruitful labor, fruitful labor. So for the apostle Paul, living is fruitful labor. He's not just saying living is working hard. No, no. But work that brings productivity is what it means to live fruitful labor. So our greatest prayer for your ministry as Ghanaians is this. That you will give us a robust educational system that will enhance national transformation and development. That is always our prayer for you. You will give us a very solid educational system that will enhance national transformation and development. And this calls for fruitful labor. Our need for wisdom, that will be the last one that I will touch. Apart from our need of God, the greatest need that all of us have is wisdom. We need wisdom from above. Because there are all kinds of wisdom in managing the affairs of life, our personal lives, and the lives of the constituencies or the institutions we survey. Isaiah 33, verse 6, your team test reads, He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge, the fear of the Lord, is the key to this treasure. In fact, we need the consciousness to appreciate the need for wisdom. I want to take that again. See, in life, when you don't appreciate something, you don't follow hard after it. There are so many Christians who are interested in casting demons. But the same power that casts demons, it is the same Holy Spirit that carries wisdom. See, Colossians chapter 3. Let's read verse 2. Are we together? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not the type that shouts that much. Uh, yeah, so, don't mind me. Colossians chapter 2, I should say. Chapter 2, verse 3. Colossians 2, 3. Can you project it? In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's go back to the verse 2 before we come to 3 so that we know the whom. My goal is that they may be encouraging heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God namely Christ. Then he puts comma. Let's take the next verse. In whom? So it is in Christ. Are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We all the same. We were Jesus or Timimu. But he came into us with treasures of all the wisdom and knowledge. So he is not only for the casting of demons. He's not only for making wealth. He is wisdom to us. But once we have the consciousness that we need wisdom, then we will follow hard after our wisdom. See, it is not enough to find a spouse. You need wisdom to manage a family. You need wisdom to manage a family. 
We need wisdom to develop the educational center. It's not about knowledge and arguments. It's not about writing theses. I know those of you here, you know, tell us what you want to tell us. Tell us what you have to tell us. Tell us what you have told us. These things, it can help. But when it comes to transformation and development, there are certain things that are greater than knowledge. Certain things that are greater than knowledge. We need to work hard at that. See, life is full of challenges. And as a result, we are always confronted with decision making. That is why we need wisdom. So you are making this decision, you are making that decision. You need wisdom to make effective decisions. You need to take decisions to move on. Otherwise, you will remain static. And decisions will call for wisdom. Decisions could be simple or complex because life can be complex and can also be simple. Challenges come in weight. Some challenges are quite simple. Others are weightier. So we need to ask for wisdom. We need wisdom because the need for wisdom becomes critical, especially when we are leaders. Because the leader's decision will have a ripple effect on the institution. Then I know that most of you here are leaders in your various departments. We have been lifted to be a supervisor, to be a departmental head, to solve tough problems, answer difficult questions, and meet uncommon needs. You see, so when you are made the chairman of the Church of Pentecost, it's not a rade medawasi. You have been lifted to meet uncommon needs. So before any problem comes onto your table, what that means is that it has not been able to be managed down there. It's a problem never been in the near feet. And this calls for wisdom. Proverbs 9, verse 1. Proverbs 9, verse 1. Wisdom has built her house. She, any time that the Bible is talking about wisdom, it refers to wisdom as a she, not he. That is the main difference. She has set up its seven pillars. It is very simplistic to define wisdom as the correct application of knowledge. No, very simplistic. Wisdom, like love, is a cluster of virtues. So it is best described than to define. But anyway, dictionaries will give us some definition. But it says that wisdom has built her house. It has lifted its seven pillars. So in wisdom are seven pillars. Proverbs chapter 8 from verse 11. I'll soon close. Proverbs 8 verse 11. Let's see if we can get the seven pillars here. From 11 to 14. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. You see the hair there again? Then let's go to verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. So when we are talking about wisdom, in wisdom is prudence. Prudence is practical wisdom. I possess knowledge. So when you see wisdom, in wisdom is knowledge. Knowledge that cannot carry wisdom. And discretion. See, there are certain people who don't know the difference between their wives and that lady. Because they lack discretion. They don't know where to put comma and full stop. They confuse the two. Yeah. You need discretion. If you ask them, how are you? Instead of just saying I'm well, they'll say, hmm, this day is my husband. They didn't ask you about your husband. They just said, how are you? See? So this is discretion. Then let's go to 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance. This is what wisdom hates. He hates pride, he hates arrogant, evil behavior, and perverse speech. So this is not part of what it has. 
It is part of what it hates. The next verse. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. So in wisdom, there's counsel. Now, if you want safety, you have to put on the wisdom belt. In a multitude of counsel, there is safety. In wisdom, there's counsel. And there is sound judgment. Formed judgment. I have insight or understanding. I have power. So let's try and count whether we can have the seven pillars. So let's start from this one. So we have what? Counsel, sound judgment, and mind. I have insight. So counsel, sound judgment, insight, power, four. So let's go to verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence, five. I possess knowledge, six, and discretion, seven. So we are saying that there are seven virtues that makes wisdom. Number one, prudence. Number two, knowledge. Number three, discretion. Number four, counsel. Number five, sound judgment. Number six, insight or understanding. And number seven, power. I'll just talk about the power and then try and conclude. What is power? Power is the ability to cause effect. So when we say someone is powerful, it's not the one who is throwing the anointing oils about. To. No, not the one who is pouring them. Not the one who is casting the demons. Wisdom too is power. Proverbs 24 verse 5. Proverbs 24 verse 5. The wise prevail through great power. And those who have knowledge master their strength. Let's take it from the New Living Translation. The wise are mightier than the strong. And those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. So wisdom is powerful. And those who have knowledge grow stronger and stronger. You should understand that knowledge is a subset of wisdom. We want to look at the effects of Solomon's wisdom. One, peace. First Kings 4.25, peace. When we have wisdom and managing the ministry well in wisdom, there will be a lot of peace. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel from Dan to Beersheba, from the north to the south, it, it says, lived in safety. Everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. That is the wisdom. He was able to manage the place and there was so much peace. Wisdom is development. Wisdom brings development. Second Chronicles 1 verse 14. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot city and also with, with him in Jerusalem. I know that you all like the next verse. I like it. I'm sure Dr. Jutum also <laughs> like this one. Uh, I'll ask a question after I've read this one. The king, that is Solomon, with the wisdom that he had, made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones. And cedar, you can find that in Lebanon. They were importing it. But with the wisdom, now he makes cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig tree. The sycamore tree, if you, you see Zacchaeus, he will tell you. It was so common like uh, the Shevata tree in the north. So he makes the cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig tree. In the foothills. How many of us would want us to have a president who can make silver and gold as common in Ghana as stones? Yeah. yeah. Some nations have so prospered to the extent that even lazy people, they give them some money. Let me conclude by saying this. We need to give thanks to God. But living in 2023 means Fruitfulness, fruitful labor. 
But effective labor calls for not just for cleverness, smartness, shrewdness, but the wisdom from above. It is this power that produces peace and development. May the Lord bless us all.